Welcome to Grad Chat by PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research. I'm your host, Courtney Applewhite. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Quick reminder to subscribe to Grad Chat on your chosen platform to get notifications about new episodes. And if you're in the mood, please leave us a rating or review. It helps people find out about the show. Our topic today is Uncovering Disability in Academia with Dr. Ruth Steinberg. Dr. Ruth Steinberg, pronouns she and her, are co-founder and executive director of Dragonfly Mental Health, a nonprofit that strives to cultivate excellent mental health and academics worldwide. She earned her PhD in cellular and molecular medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in 2020 and has been working in the mental health and academia advocacy space for over 10 years. In line with her passion for writing and community building. Rue is also the editor-in-chief of Dragonfly Digital Diaries, Dragonfly's monthly newsletter, which exists as a safe space for academics to share their lived experiences in academia and or with mental health, and invites academics to be vulnerable in order to help fight the stigma that exists in academic spaces. So uh, there's definitely a lot of overlap in some of the goals of PhD Balance and uh, Dragonfly Mental Health and, and Dragonfly Digital Diaries. So we're really excited to have Dr. Ruth Steinberg join us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're, our topic for today is a big one, right? So it's uncovering disability in academia. Can we start by just trying to define some of the language around disability? What is a disability and what does it mean to self-identify as disabled? Yeah, so according to the ADA, a person uh, who has a physical or mental impairment that affects their major life activities is considered a disability that's considered a disability now as to whether or not someone considers themselves disa disabled that's a very personal choice um, it's kind of a a mantle that someone takes on and they can choose not to identify that way uh, there's also you know you mentioned the language surrounding it there's a lot of um, talk around what's what's more correct, disabled person or person with a disability. Um, and I actually spoke to a bunch of my friends within this space to, to get a really well-rounded answer. And, and the result is it's really personal preference. Um, it's more about what you think when you say the word. So when you say disabled person, it shouldn't make you feel bad to say it. If it does, you're probably having some negative connotation on that word. Um, so really it's about how we think about disability um, and, and what it means to each individual to be disabled. So it sounds like this is a conversation you should have with people if they do identify that way or, or asking them, you know, well, I... I recently, you know, I said that you were a disabled person. Can I, can I ask you what kind of language you prefer to use? Is that, is that something that we should all be doing or, or think about doing? Yeah, I think that would be a great, you know, um, sensitive practice to start doing to make sure that we're um, being mindful of, of what the individual wants. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Well, can you tell me more about what your personal experience of coming to terms with and understanding your own disability? Yeah. So I actually, um, I've been, I have had health issues my whole life, but I never considered myself disabled until uh, towards the end of graduate school, actually. And so it was during that time period when a lot of different aspects of my health were sort of taking a downturn. Um, I started to get diagnoses that started to add up to um, a genetic connective tissue disorder, which was what my ultimate diagnosis was. Um, and over that last year and the last few years, my health has continued to decline to a certain degree. And I now walk with a cane, whereas I didn't walk with a cane before. Um, and I've decided that, you know, I consider myself disabled. Um, it was some, it was the decision to make, you know, it wasn't an automatic, oh, you know, Monday I'm, I'm not disabled and Tuesday all of a sudden I am, you know, it's, it's a conscious decision. You have to think about it, what it means, what it means, you know, for, for your access. Um, I found that taking on that label of being disabled has helped me a lot in my day-to-day -day life. Um, a lot of times, you know, we talk about invisible disability and especially, you know, if I didn't walk with a cane, 
people might not know that I was disabled. And if I'm standing on a city bus and there's a disability seat there, you know, no one's going to think to get up for a 30 year old, you know, unless they're pregnant. <laughs> and so, you know, me taking on that mantle and that that identity um, made it easier for me to assert myself in situations where advocating for myself was, was important for my health and safety. Yeah, and so you were in graduate school when you sort of came to terms with this or, or when, when, where were you at in your academic journey and how did that align with, with this process? Yeah, I would say it was somewhere in the last year of graduate school. Um, was when all the pieces sort of started coming together. That that's definitely solidified over the last few years. So I graduated in 2020, and now we're in 2022, almost the end of 2022. Um, so it's definitely become more of a, a concrete idea in my mind of what that means to me. Um, but back then, it was something that I, I struggled with, definitely. I think a lot of people who are considering whether or not they want to you know, take on the the identity of being disabled is, you know, the internalized ableism that you have to combat. We're all sort of conditioned to think about it as a bad thing. Um, and so, you know, it takes a lot of mental work to, to work through that. Um, and, and that work continues on throughout the disability journey. So even afterwards, um, there was a point where I was deciding, do I get a wheelchair? And there's this question, you know, that I that I had that I asked myself, well, like, am I disabled enough? And the idea that someone has to, you know, quantify it in that way that there's, you know, gatekeeping in a sense as to whether or not you're disabled enough, that shouldn't be the case. It's if something will improve your day-to-day -day life, your, you know, ability to access places, um, you know, do things you wouldn't be able to do without those mobility aids, then use them. Like you don't have to be enough of anything to use a mobility aid. Um, and so those kinds of conversations were ones that I had sort of with myself and then, you know, with my family, with friends who, you know, were incredibly supportive of me to kind of be like asking them their opinion. Well, what would you think if, you know, I came in one day and I really wasn't feeling well and I used a wheelchair, you know, to try and gauge what people, you know, what the response would be and, and see how I felt about that response. And so it's, you know, a stepwise journey. You go a little bit at a time. Um, if you're able to, for me, you know, I, I had that time to transition for some people. Unfortunately, it's, it's not that, um, you know, you don't have as much time depending on the nature of the disability. Um, but yeah, definitely there's a lot of internalized ableism that goes into, um, that whole thought process. Yeah. And one of the things that also makes me think of, and you can tell me if this is appropriate, is some of the language even sounds like imposter syndrome in some ways, which of oh, course yeah. in graduate school, you're already feeling. So. Yeah, exactly. That, that is a perfect word for it. I mean, the, the nature of imposter phenomenon is that you feel like you're not enough, right? That you don't belong and someone's going to find out you're a fake. And, you know, that correlates so well to the example of a wheelchair. Most people, when they see someone in a wheelchair, they assume they can't walk. But there are a lot of people who can walk who still use wheelchairs, myself included. And so there's always this fear that you're going to, you know, get up out of your wheelchair and your dad's going to put it in the back of the car and some Karen's going to come over and say, you know, I see you walking. Why are you parked in a disability parking spot? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and unfortunately, those kinds of things happen to people. So that that's something that sticks in your mind. You're like, wow, I'm, I'm opening myself up to criticism. Uh, and of course, that criticism shouldn't be there because there shouldn't be gatekeepers on on, you know, anybody's personal journey with disability and uh, chronic health issues in general. Absolutely. And, you know, you gave a, like an example out in the world of somebody questioning or, or being insensitive or ableist or, or these words. So did you find in your graduate program, did you experience forms of resistance or discrimination or ableism, either, either conscious or unconscious as you were sort of, you know, coming to terms with your disability or in the early stages of understanding it? 
Yeah, I was really, really fortunate in that I had an incredibly supportive um, lab, you know, friends, my PI, I, I had that um, to fall back on, and they were always making sure that I was okay. So, you know, when I got diagnosed with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which very often can cause people to just pass out all over the place. Um, I would, I remember very clearly I was coming out of the train and walking towards the building where my lab was. And I started to feel really faint. And I called one of my lab mates, a good friend. And I was like, can you come meet me? I'm going to pass out. And he came, you know, came running and I did like sort of keel over and, you know, had to rest and recover from that. And you know, I went up to where the, the cubicles were and there's a couch there and I laid on the couch and the environment that was created within my lab and the labs, you know, on our floor was so supportive that I didn't feel weird, you know, resting for an hour on the couch to make sure that when I stood up again, I wouldn't pass out. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel like, I don't want to say that I'm the exception to the rule, um, but definitely my experience was above and beyond the positive experiences of most people. Um, that said, there were other, you know, sort of systemic things that, you know, as a university, there are a lot of things that, that impact you. Um, and so, for example, I remember also around that same time when I was getting that diagnosis, um, there was an orientation presentation in a room that was not accessibility friendly. And I only, as this was like the beginning of my, you know, journey as, as a disabled person, I went into the room down the flight of stairs and only after I got to the bottom, did I think, oh, how am I going to get back out? <laughs> and, you know, when, when you think about that's, that's the room that they used for orientation for all of the new students in the incoming year, that's a problem. Um, and so things like that can be brought up to administration. And there are so many changes that can be made that are slowly but surely being incorporated into, you know, institution sort of lexicon of what do we do to make things uh, accessible. And so some of those things are, you know, making rooms accessible, um, accessibility parking, having that available. Um, usually there's never enough, <laughs> um, but, you know, making sure there's, there's a fair number of accessible parking spaces, um, things that, you know, when we think of, of disability, sometimes we think of um, physical impairments first, but there's also, you know, visual impairments and people don't think about, you know, people who are colorblind. Um, very often when people are making PowerPoint presentations, they want to make it look pretty, um, but they don't think about whether or not everyone will be able to distinguish, you know, bar A from bar B, if there's not enough of a color difference, um, or, you know, the, the sort of rules of colorblindness are not applied. Um, and just as a side note, you can never go wrong with a gradient. If you go from a dark version of a color to a medium to a light, that, you know, even if you put that in gray, you can, you can usually see the difference. Um, but yeah, so some of those kinds of things, I think more universities nowadays are recording lectures, um, you know, if students can't make it to the lecture and, and that's really important to record it, but also to make sure that the closed captions are accurate so that people who, you know, need those, um, people who are hearing impaired, um, or even, I mean, I like to watch videos with, with closed captions, uh, just in case you miss a word here and there. And it's, you know, incredibly important that some, that there's somebody sort of on staff or somebody put in charge of making sure that, that those are all accurate. And all of those together sort of come back to the idea that there needs to be budgeting for thinking about accessibility on campus. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> that's the main thing. Coming back to the finances. It always does. And it, it always, um, I think it's so important to think about where money in the university goes and where it doesn't go, right? And so this yeah. is one of those great examples of, you know, a lot of these issues do require funds and you have to put money towards these kinds of issues to to make them 
visible and important and all these things. And so when you were in graduate school, um, you, you mentioned you had a really strong support system and there were a few instances. Did you see any growth in the support of the, at the university that you were at and whenever you were there, as far as access and that kind of, those kind of systemic issues? Yeah. Um, I myself wasn't active in that group. I was more, um, active active in the mental health advocacy space, starting a a peer support group. Um, But there was sort of a a coexisting group that was specifically formed to look at the accessibility on campus. And there were some really wonderful graduate students who were prioritizing that and were making sure that they were talking to, um, you know, people high up in the administration. And since I've left, there have been a lot of changes, which is wonderful. When I was there, um, most classes weren't recorded. Um, We were really fortunate in my year, we had um, a really great uh, classmate who would record everything on his computer. (laughs) So we all had recorded videos, but for the most part, like the university didn't have the recorded videos. And if they had any sort of version of it, it was like a an audio file as opposed to a video. Um, so there's no closed captioning, nothing like that. Um, and, and since I've left, they've incorporated those and made sure that that's more of a priority. So yeah, positive changes are definitely happening, um, but I think it's largely in part to the advocacy that graduate students are doing in this space. Yeah, that's right. So it's definitely a grassroots effort as opposed yeah. to like upper, upper management, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, it sounds like you, you mentioned that you felt like you were very fortunate with the situation that you had in your lab and your lab mates. So what, what kind of advice can you offer to others who have a disability or themselves coming to terms with their disability while in graduate school or when thinking about going to graduate school, maybe? Yeah, I think some advice would be, you know, if you're already in graduate school, um, put your needs first, (laughs) you know, if there's something that you need, it's going to be a little uncomfortable at first to, you know, bring up some of these topics, especially if faculty doesn't have any sort of sensitivity training. Um, But, you know, if, if something can improve the quality of your day and you're spending days on end in the lab um, and you want to use, you know, a heating pad on the back of your your neck and not get, you know, funny looks, um, you know, make a sort of public service announcement, talk to your PI, talk to your lab mates, you know, um, this is what's going on. Um, You might see me with a neck brace, you might see me with a heating pad. It's just, you know, there to help me um, and it's no big deal and, you know, then people know that it's, it's just part of the process. It's part of what you need to make sure that you're successful in graduate school. Um, Because I find that also a lot of times people don't know when to say something or when to ask about things. Um, And so, you know, one thing to say, you know, for, for faculty or things like that, like what not to do is, you know, if you see a graduate student um, who has a, a heating pad, let's say on their neck, to continue with that analogy, you know, don't walk up to them and be like, you know, well, what is that for? <laughs> you know, um, people with disabilities ha- spend so much time advocating for themselves, so they shouldn't have to have to feel like they have to explain themselves on a day-to-day basis if they, you know, use one mobility aid or another or, um, you know, something like a heating pad. Um, so yeah, main, main advice for people who are in graduate school is, um, put your needs first. Um, it's definitely, you know, it's not always easy to, to speak up for yourself. If that's something that you're struggling with, try and find other people on campus who are being loud and proud about it and, and talking about the things that need changing and potentially they can be a voice for you. Um, so that's that's one advice, that, you know, I would give if, if you're in graduate school. Going to graduate school, um, I don't know that the advice is is that much different except, you know, I found that if you if you make people aware of things ahead of time, um, they're they're much more likely to acquiesce to any like requests that you might have because they're expecting it. They're not like blindsided by it. And so the more you know open you can be about what your needs may be in the future, um, 
that can definitely help smooth the process along. Um, other than that, I don't know. Um, before getting to graduate school, hmm, that is a really good question. I don't know. I, I mean, when I was applying to graduate school, I, I didn't consider myself disabled. So I'm trying to think of, you know, what I might have done um, if I had been in this position. I definitely would have told them, you know, what my limitations are and what things I would struggle with. Um, and I have no doubt that they would have helped, you know, provide solutions for that. Um, so I think that's that's one of the main takeaways, I guess, is that most people, you know, once you bring something up and and it's, you know, an easy fix for them to help you, like most people are happy to help. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. The worst thing that could happen is that they say no. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so what do you think would be red flags if you're shopping for a lab, for example, and you consider you you consider yourself disabled and you maybe are upfront with them, like this is what I need. What are some things that are perhaps red flags that it may not be the best environment for you to work in? Yeah. If if you're, you know, visiting a lab or you spend, you know, a rotation in a lab and you've made your needs clear and they're being ignored, that's definitely a red flag. Um, you know, if it's like you're there for a day, then okay, it takes some getting used to on other people's part. But if you're there for a longer period of time, even a week is long enough for someone to, you know, incorporate those habits of making sure, um, you know, if someone's visually impaired, that there aren't, you know, boxes in the middle of the aisles between the benches and things like that, things are organized and um, in places where you expect them to be, you know, um, all of those kinds of things that you can do to, to, create more of an ease of access. Um, so if, you know, you've made your needs clear and you've suggested, you know, this is what you can do to help um, and you're clearly being ignored, um, even if it's under the guise of like, oh, I forgot, like it's too hard for me to remember, like that's not a good enough excuse. Um, that's, that's a cover up of a red flag, but it's still a red flag. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that those things are really important to keep in mind, especially, well, and you know, it, it's applicable to all graduate students. I think all graduate students should be aware when they're shopping for labs that you have needs that need to be addressed. And I think it's just amplified in these cases, right? Because they're specific yeah. to not only your mental well-being, but often your physical well-being, right? So these are- Yeah, exactly. Yeah, are, and that's that's what I, you know, when you think about disability, it's it coincides so much with mental health. So there are things, you know, from a red flag perspective in a lab, if you see the language that they use to talk about you is, you know, upsetting or, um, you know, insensitive. And, you know, you, you get a sense for the environment that, that there will be exclusion um, or you made to feel like you're other or less than, um, you know, those are all big, red flags, even though it don't, it might not necessarily impact your experiments, it will definitely impact your mental health. Um, and I think that's, that's one thing that, you know, members of a lab who have someone who has a disability within that lab can keep in mind, is that, you know, the way you talk about your lab mates matters, it makes a difference and never assume, never assume things for people with disabilities. I think a lot of the time people, people just say, oh, well, they won't be able to do it you know, um, when very often given the right mobility aids, given the right, you know, that the accessibility that needs to be there is in place, then they can do those things. Um, so it's, it's less about identifying the things that they can, can't do and more about figuring out ways that they can do all the things everybody else can do. Um, so that's one way that, that lab mates and faculty can, can support their um, peers and students. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is a great way to frame it because I think so often the language is around, oh, they can't do that. Oh, they can't do this. And instead it should be about, you know, how can, I mean, it's, it, how can we make this equitable for everyone? It's an equi it's like a conversation about equity, right? It's about making Definitely. things accessible and equitable. And I do feel like 
this conversation is happening in a lot of different forums. And I think it's important to spotlight all the different places in which we need to be actively thinking about this, thinking about others, thinking about others' needs. You know, you can think about it if we do analogous needs like dietary needs. And then, you know, um, yeah, like, I mean, I'm just, I mean, there's, there's tons of examples. I mean, we, we do this when we talk about pronouns and our gender yeah. identities, right? So these are all just an awareness of other people's needs in, in different ways. Exactly. And the more we make things as accessible as possible and, and have that as a priority, the more we'll also be able to help people who have invisible disabilities who aren't comfortable speaking up about it. And mental health can become a disability. Um, you know, if you're struggling, um, you know, there it can definitely impact one or more major life activities. Um, and so, you know, if someone doesn't feel safe or comfortable talking about those things, if there are already measures in place, um, that will do a world of good in terms of helping them when they're already, you know, already down and, and need a hug. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, um, in the end, when it comes to invisible disabilities, especially mental health, a lot of times it comes down to healthcare and financial difficulties. Um, so, you know, you mentioned what, what might be barriers or, um, you know, things where people can feel restricted that they, that they don't have access. That's definitely one of them. And I know there are a lot of universities who are starting funds for people in that situation so that they, they can do a little bit to help. I mean, you know, um, but definitely if universities prioritize this, making sure they have enough staff to accommodate everybody who needs counseling or therapy or, um, you know, doctors, things like that, um, you know, thinking about that is important to remember that when you have a disability, be it physical or mental, um, the, the financial distress that it causes significantly impacts your mental health. So it's sort of this, this cycle. Um, and so the more support you can give in all of these sort of adjacent things that are affected by a person's disability or chronic health issue, um, thinking about those can also be incredibly helpful when it comes to what supportive measures can we put in place. Absolutely. It's remarkable how much we could solve if we uh, really supported healthcare endeavors. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting that like, you know, when it comes to mental health, there's there's this divide, I think, sometimes um, between mental health professionals and clinicians and other uh, health professionals. And I know um, people with disabilities and people with mental health um, struggles have, have come up against this. I myself have come up against this where you're not taken seriously um, for, you know, the, ex the extent to which it's um, you know, causing difficulties in your life. Um, and, you know, what, what you need, usually a person has a pretty clear idea of, you know, what they would need to make them feel that, okay, my needs are being thought of, they're being taken care of and things like that. Um, and it's very often that people with disabilities and people with mental health issues will will end up in an office of somebody who will be like, you're just anxious, you know, do some yoga. <laughs> or, you know, if it's a, a health issue, a chronic health issue, there's always the, you know, maybe lose some weight, or, you know, um, maybe you are just tired or dehydrated, or maybe you're just anxious. These are all sort of the, the verbiage that's used to invalidate your experience. Um, and I think, Clinicians in general need more training um, to ensure that that doesn't happen um, because it's it's medical gaslighting is a real thing um, where, you know, clinicians tell you it's all in your head and you start to believe it. Um, but like for something like my condition that, you know, it takes on average over 10 years to diagnose Ehlers-Danlos syndrome because it's so rarely diagnosed. It's affect so many different things that it's, you know, hard to see the full picture and all the puzzle pieces. And so many times over the years, I was told, you know, maybe you just need to relax a little bit, you know, um, 
you were just dehydrated, all of those kinds of, of poo, 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 kind of like, oh, you know, I know you think this is really bad, but it's not so calm down kind of um, conversations. Those, those can be avoided. They're, it's stress and anxiety and really, you know, anguish, mental health anguish that, that is caused by those kinds of insensitive conversations. Yeah. And we've talked about this a little bit before. And do you think that your identification as a woman has also impacted that sort of medical gaslighting a little bit? Definitely. I definitely think it has. Um, I, I can't speak to the experience of, of any other genders and, and whether or not this happens to them as well. Um, but I know for me, I've definitely been, you know, treated like I don't know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, I'm th- those like old fashioned terms of like, oh, you know, it's, it's hysteria or, you know, hysteria. like, yeah, exactly. Those words. Um, I mean, I remember, I mean, I started having health issues way back in my teens. And I remember a neurologist asking my mom to come into the doctor's office and me to sit in the waiting room. And she told my mom I was faking it. Like point blank told my mom I was fake. She's just faking it for attention. And I think women are more often, um, you know, they're thought of as like, oh, you're making a fuss about something that doesn't really need to be, you know, be quiet. You know, it's, it's calm down. You're, you know, making it into something bigger than it needs to be. Um, and so that's, that's definitely a lot of the, the language that I've come up against that um, other women that I know have come up against. Um, and I mean, <laughs> that happened when I was like 15 and, you know, 16 years later, I still remember it. You know, I remember that doctor's name. I remember sitting in that office and I remember hearing my mom yell at her <laughs> because my mom advocated for me being like, I know my child, she's not making it up. Um, and so that just sort of illustrates the importance of having a really good support system because you can start to feel like you're going a little crazy. Um, but when your peers validate you and validate your experiences and, you know, are there for you when you need them and will advocate for you, um, that makes all the difference in, in a person's experience of this. Yeah, I can, I can, I can imagine that it would be a much different story if you didn't have those people in your lab that supported you and the, the joint efforts of, it sounds like the community that you've kind of found since then in particular that advocates on, um, on behalf of disabled people. So I do, I want to ask, so what do you think non-disabled people can do within their academic communities to be more inclusive of colleagues who are disabled or can work to enact change in their own programs? Yeah, I think it's primarily awareness and sort of literacy of the issues that affect disabled people. Um, even, you know, when I when I was taking on that mantle of disability, there were things that I, I noticed that I had never noticed before. So it's more of a, you know, if it's not pointed out to you, you don't think about it. So almost having a checklist, I feel like can be really helpful. You know, if you're making a PowerPoint presentation, have the checklist of, okay, these are the things I need to do to make it accessible. I need to make sure the colors are accessible. I need to make sure that the font is big enough. I need to make sure that there's alt text on the graphics if you're gonna be giving the slides out. I mean, there are so many different things you can do um, and there are so many tools to help. I mean, PowerPoint has an accessibility checker. and so there are tools that can be utilized to make it easier. Um, and I think if, if people just sort of had a checklist of, of here are the 10 things to think about when you're, you know, trying to improve things in your program in the disability space. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's awareness and conscientiously, um, you know, reminding yourself when you're in situations to make decisions about those things. Yeah, that's a great tip about, I didn't realize that PowerPoint had an accessibility checker. So that's a great tip because that's something very easy. Cause I mean, it's just like doing yeah. a, I assume it's sort of like doing a um, spell check almost that so just runs it for you. Right. Yeah, exactly. And it'll tell you, you know, you need to put alt text on this and it's, it's makes things definitely a lot easier. Um, and there are so many tools also like 
for closed captioning. There are a lot of AI tools. Um, I mean, even YouTube, it'll do it for things that don't have closed captioning, it's sort of predictive text and things like that. So it does a lot of the hard work for you in terms of giving you a base what to work with. And then you just need to go make sure that everything's correct. Um, and so, you know, look at the tools that you utilize on a day-to-day -day basis and just check to see if they have something in there, something in the tool repertoire that that's, you know, about accessibility. And most often I think you'll find one. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's really important. And I think that just having, so maybe an action item for people, if they were interested in, in making their part, their individual departments more accessible or their lab more accessible is to share, share that tip about PowerPoint or even finding, I, I'm, I'm sure there's resources online of those kinds of checklists that people could send around to their listserv or their, you know, on their Slack channel or something. Can you yeah. think of any other like immediate tips that people could take away to make their departments more accessible like today? Yeah. I mean, one thing that you brought to mind in terms of how do we get the message out there, um, you know, make a graphic, make a flyer and post it up next to your elevator and give it to your friend who's in a different building. And, you know, if everybody puts one by all of, you know, there's one poster by all of the elevators that's informational, that's clear, concise, gives really easy, actionable items for, for people to do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's one way that can be really great of getting the word out. Um, in terms of what people can do like right now, um, I mean, if you're working on a PowerPoint, <laughs> check that accessibility checker. Um, if you're uh, in your lab space um, and you know that there's somebody who um, has a visual impairment, make sure that things are put back where they're supposed to be put back so that there's an expectation of, they because people with visual impairment very often rely on where things are supposed to be. Um, and so that can be really important to put things back where they're supposed to go um, to, you know, make sure that there's no clutter in the halls, things that people can trip over. Um, trying to think of what else. Um, for, for mental health, um, I mean, if you know that there's somebody struggling, um, whether it's a peer or a colleague, um, you know, you can, you can ask them, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And if you don't feel comfortable, like just invite them out for a coffee. Sometimes just sitting down with someone and having like a 15 minute coffee break where you don't think about all of the other things that are stressing you out can be really, really impactful on a person's day. And they don't have to think about it as like, oh, they're worried about me. You know, it's, it's less, it's, it's more innocuous, you know, it's, it's something that, that anybody could do with any, any peer, colleague, friend. Um, so yeah, I'd say if you could do one thing today, um, you know, ask a friend or a colleague or a lab mate out for coffee for 15 minutes, take a coffee break for them to join you. Um, and I think that can, that can do a world of good because even, I mean, it sort of encompasses both the physical disabilities and the mental health disabilities because people with physical disabilities very often, the part that's, you know, stressful that, that Im impacts our, our mental health is, is our chronic health. It's sort of a, a push and pull on mental health and, and chronic illness. Um, and so it encompasses both invisible disabilities for people who are struggling and we might not know it, um, as well as people who we know, you know, have visible disabilities. Um, but even so, a lot of times people with visible disabilities are really optimistic, and really positive on the outside, but, you know, it can be really, um, stressful and, and, um, frustrating to to be in the disability space when things still need to change um, and so you know broaching those kinds of conversations just to get it out um, can help as well yeah I think that I think that making connections with people generally just as you say is so important but then also checking in with people when you know that they have particular you know challenges that they're working through I think is even more important. And one thing that I did want to touch on um, that I'd wanted to come back to, you know, we've been using this language of invisible disability and, and 
you touched on earlier this this notion of privacy. So how do you find navigating, you know, as a disabled person that sometimes doesn't necessarily affect as disabled or and like how do you how do you navigate that conversation with people and you know as somebody who is not disabled you know how do i navigate the boundary between the privacy that i want to afford people who do have disability and my you know you know innate desire to want to accommodate as best i can does that question yeah. make sense yeah um it's it's a really great question um I mean, when, when my disability isn't visible to others, um, I definitely do feel that I'm a, I'm a little bit silenced just by the fact that it's not seen. It, it makes me feel much more cautious about bringing it up. Um, whereas, you know, if I'm walking with a cane, it's a little bit self-explanatory um, and people understand you know, are are much more understanding or much more readily understanding. Um, So I think part of it is you never know what someone's story is. um, And and it could be, you know, incredibly surprising to you um, or they may not want to share it at all. Um, But if someone says, you know, asks you of something that that can support them, don't question it, you know, like give them the support first and then see if they want to talk, if they're comfortable talking. Um, I mean, everybody has their own boundaries when it comes to these things. Um, Personally, I'm really open about these things. As you can see by this podcast, I think it's important to talk about it, to empower other people to talk about it. Um, But not everybody wants to be that open about it. And so, you know, I feel like you can't go wrong if you ask, you know, you can ask a question and follow it up with only if you're comfortable talking about it, you know, to, to just put it out there that you're respecting their boundaries if they don't want to talk about it. Um, but that you're there for them if they do. Yeah. And I think that so many of our conversations that we have on, on this podcast come back to boundary setting and respecting people's boundaries and honoring where people are at in their own journeys and, you know, all of those things that should be at this point, you know, a given, but unfortunately often aren't. So I think that that's a great, uh, that's a great message. And I think in, in the disability space, it might be an even more critical one again, because we return to the fact that, you know, the, this is, this is people's ability to do, to do things in the world and to be in the world and their physical health and the things that we really need to respect and, and be attentive to. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when it's something, um, it can be like the littlest things that people might not equate with disability. Um, but like, if you have a colleague who you notice is, you know, wearing the same shirt two days in a row or, um, you know, says they need to leave lab for a period of time to, to get something important done. Um, you know, those kinds of things that you, you can get a sense of whether or not they'd be embarrassed if you mentioned it, just don't mention it, you know, (laughs) like those kinds of things. I mean, there are days where it is, you, you don't have enough spoons to take a shower. Um, you know, I don't know if your listeners know about the spoon theory, but it's, Essentially, everybody's given a number of spoons um, and every activity takes up a number of spoons. And for people with disabilities, each activity can take up more spoons than they would for the average person. So if I have 10 spoons and one day, you know, my joints are all acting up and everything hurts and I just don't have the spoons to take a shower while also having the spoons to make myself something to eat and to, um, you know, get myself out of bed, um, then we have to, we have to ration them um, accordingly. And so sometimes that's, you know, for someone who's struggling with depression, sometimes that's, you know, wearing a shirt twice instead of, you know, putting it straight in the laundry because it will, they know it will um, necessitate that they do laundry quicker, um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with wearing a shirt twice, <laughs> um, you know, but that, that kind of thing where, um, some of those things might make you you worry for a colleague, um, but 
if you see, if you're providing the support that we talked about before, you're there to talk to them, you know, you, you make sure that they know that you're there for them. Um, I think not mentioning things that could be potentially um, embarrassing is, is important when it comes to that boundary setting and things that we can do in a day to day um, that people might not think about when it comes to mental health. You know, you might be like, oh, are you wearing the same shirt as yesterday? Like you, you might not realize that, that, that they did that because if they didn't do that, then they wouldn't have been able to get themselves to lab, you know? Um, so sometimes it's the little things. Um, and I think the majority of the disability community recognizes that it's not easy to train, retrain yourself to think this way. Um, you know, it's, it's a sensitivity that that needs to be learned and cultivated over a period of time. So don't, you know, for the, for the non-disabled folks, don't beat yourself up about it. If you're, you know, if you don't catch on to it right away, if it's a little bit difficult, um, it's a process. Um, and, and each little step is appreciated by the people in your life who it impacts. Yeah. I think that that's that, I mean, that's, the key, right, is you're, we we try to make progress towards being better and being being more um, aware and sensitive in all these different areas as we as we grow as people, right? So I think that that's yeah. all all really important. And the last thing that I that comes to mind that I wanted to be sure that we talked about. So we talked briefly about your graduate school experience, and you know it was it was positive. But I can imagine that some of our listeners might have had or are having really challenging times in their lab or with their advisor who doesn't honor their disability or respect their boundaries or you know do these different things. So what should they do? What should their recourse be, do you think? Um, I mean, to a certain degree, my, my first instinct is to, you know, go to the disability office <laughs> um, because there, there is recourse for these things, even if you don't see it being, um, you know, what's the word? If you don't see it being... Um, like legally, yeah, like it. Oh, enforced. That's the word. enforced. Yeah, there's <laughs> a little brain fog right there. No, no, that's all good. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you don't see those those things that should be enforced being enforced, um, you can still go to the disability office, and when you bring a specific complaint, um, they're they have to act on it. They have to check to make sure, you know, whether or not you have a serious claim and things like that. Um, so that's one, one level of recourse. Um, another is, um, I mean, it depends on to, to what degree it's, it's affecting your life and your mental health and your work. Um, if it, if the environment is untenable, I would suggest switching labs. And I know there's a huge taboo about switching labs and, and what it may do for your career or take away from your career or things like that. And I have known many, many scientists who have switched labs and gone on to have successful careers. And I think that taboo is sort of being, you know, wiped away little by little because we realize that um, switching, switching a lab doesn't mean, it's not reflective of you. It's not, you know, a lot of us, tend to um, calculate our self-worth based off of like our success. And even if it's a stressful situation or a horrible situation, we're like, well, we have to tough, you know, tough it out and we have to stick through it because otherwise I'll have failed in some way. Um, and switching labs is not a failure. Switching labs is a conscious decision to prioritize your health and your mental health. And I think that should be empowering. Um, and so, you know, if it's to that degree, switch labs, I say, go for it. Um, if, if it's, you know, little things here and there, and you haven't had a conversation with those individuals, or you've been, you know, nervous to you, you don't know what the repercussions might be. Um, test the waters, I would say, you know, um, it's difficult. It's not easy, but sometimes people will surprise you. Um, and if you you have the conversation from the viewpoint, you know, of 
this is something that that I need um, to feel supported and to be able to do my work as opposed to these are the things you're doing wrong. Um, you know, if you approach it from a place of I, as opposed to a place of you, that can set the tone for a conversation like that. And once they don't think it's about them, it's, you know, you can even generalize it, you know, this is a public service announcement for everybody. This is something that would really, really help me. Um, you know, it's, it's important to make your, your needs known, even if you can't do it in as direct a way as you would like. Um, I think the people who are catering to those needs, uh, you know, if you generalize to the whole group, they'll just be like, yep, this should be happening all along. Um, so I don't think anyone would, would take offense if they're already doing it. And the people who aren't won't realize everybody else is doing it because they're not thinking about it. <laughs> so, you know, making those kinds of um, sort of public service announcements can help. Um, and I know not everybody is, is comfortable doing that. And, um, that was, that was something that I did a lot. Um, I even do that at home in my house, you know, with my family, if I'm having a, a rough day, which is like public service announcement, everyone should know I'm not feeling well. So if I'm snappish, that is why. <laughs> and that just sets the tone for like, oh, okay. And usually after I make a public service announcement like that, my mom will give me a hug because she knows I want a hug and I can, I can see that happening in the lab space as well. The peers that I had who were incredibly supportive when I, you know, voiced something that I was struggling with, you know, they would give me a hug. They would, you know, do little things to help me feel supported. If it's, you know, taking over a lab chore for a week for me, or, you know, helping out with an experiment because I'm, you know, my arms are bothering me and I can't do things as fast as I would normally. Um, those kinds of things. There are lots of ways that people can can pitch in, um, but yeah, that that was generally my brand of <laughs> of addressing things. Just be just be open and loud and proud about it, because um, you have nothing to be ashamed of. But I know that's easier said than done. Absolutely, but I I think that you set a great example for people who are advocating for themselves, and then subsequently would also be advocating for others that don't have the um, you know, the desire to sort of step out and, and, and share with people that, you know, these very personal things that are going on. Um, so I think that you, you, you definitely serve a very valuable, uh, place in that, in that regard. And I would also add that there might be a, you know, in our department, for example, there is a graduate student liaison Mm -hmm. who kind of does these sort of communications with graduate students. And really their aim is to liaise between the faculty and the students in some ways. But if you have a representative in your department, that's somebody else that you might be able to go to and just say, Hey, could you make a public service announcement? That's just from you as a voice in the department that says, you know, would it be, it would be great if we could do X, Y, and Z. Um, And that kind of neutral third party would be a way to, if it's a faculty member you're having issues with, they can communicate with the faculty members, or if it's graduate students or other members of your lab, it's like a third party that can then get that message to them. So maybe recruiting people who have positions of like middling power that can then get your message out, I think would be a good, good way to go as well. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. Great. Okay. Well, before we finish up, is there anything else that you'd like to mention or talk about that's important for our listeners to know? Um, I think the main message, you know, when it comes to mental health and when it comes to disability and when it comes to the crossover between the two um, that I like to, to hammer home because I know it's something that so many people, including myself, struggle with, be kind to yourself you know, in, in all regards, if you're struggling with disability or struggling with health, um, you know, think about the words you choose to talk about yourself in your own head and whether or not you would use those same words to talk about somebody else you care about, um, and reframe things a little bit for yourself. Um, I think that's really important. And even for people who, who aren't experiencing those things and, and our allies and who want to help make things better, but they feel like they're not doing enough. Same goes like be kind to yourself. Any little thing that you're doing helps. 
Um, you know, any small way that you're supporting your peers who are struggling um, is important. It can it can make or break people. So, you know, academics need to learn to to have more positive self talk and and be kind to themselves um, when when everybody's struggling with something. You know. Absolutely. I think that's a great message. And I think that's something that everybody needs to hear. Um, because yeah, we all, we all are, have our challenges in grad school is hard enough. Right. So, yeah. so thank yep. you so much for sharing with us and sharing your own journey and sharing how we can make the lives in our departments better, the lives of our of people in our departments and our departments way better. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to reach your audience. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, so Rue is editor in chief of Dragonfly Digital Diaries. So if you are interested in this nexus between academia and mental health, you should definitely look over there to learn more about that. Um, it's a great complement to PhD balance and the community we've built here. A lot of education going on at Dragonfly. So be sure to check them out. Yeah. And we're also, if anyone is interested in sharing their story, um, we're, we're always taking submissions for the newsletter as well. So, um, you know, we provide us a place for your, your voice to be heard. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, this has been Grad Chat by PhD Balance. Our episodes are now posted simultaneously on our podcast and YouTube channel. You can connect with PhD Balance on our website at phdbalance.com or on social media on Twitter and Instagram at phd underscore balance. Until next time, bye and take care of yourselves.